So thank you for joining for the first presentation in our Westerville Ecological Services Rocky Mountain Region um, Virtual Brown Bag Seminar Series. We will be doing this quarterly, so um, we appreciate you, you joining us. Um, a couple of things, we're, we're a small team. You can see us all here, actually. All our videos are on, there's four of us in this region, and we're relatively new. Um, we're gonna introduce ourselves over the next few slides. So, um, and tell you a little bit about the company and then jump into the, the meat and potatoes. Like Chloe said, this is being recorded. So if you fall asleep or need to help your kid do homework, um, you, can, you can reference this through a link that's gonna be sent out later. Um, everyone's muted, so please type your questions or comments in the chat box um, and we'll get to it at the end. I do wanna say that I see that we have some folks like Noah Greenberg and Patrick Jacobs on this call who are actually much more well-versed in this than I am. Um, so we do wanna have you know, an open dialogue at the end where folks can share their insight and experiences. Um, and then finally, this, even these first three months of 2021 have been a little bit of regulatory whiplash. So um, there's a lot going on, there's a lot in this presentation and there's a lot that could be outdated by the end of the presentation because it's changing so rapidly. So um, thanks for, for sticking, sticking in with this. Um, sticking with us on all this. But uh, first, Lucy's gonna, gonna give a little welcome message. So um, Lucy, if you wanna take it away. Yeah, sure, thanks Tyler. So thank you again, everybody for joining us on this really amazing Friday afternoon. I think spring is finally here in uh, Colorado till it's, you know, negative 10 again, but that's, that's how things go. Um, I'm Lucy Harrington. I'm the regional director for uh, Westervelt Rocky Mountain Region, small but mighty team, as Tyler mentioned. Um, you know, we, we pride ourselves in really understanding regulations and the regulatory framework as it pertains, especially to mitigation, since that is what we do here at Westervelt is only mitigation. But um, we, we really do appreciate a number of your expertise on the call with us today. And so a dialogue at the end, we will have some time for questions and, and um, conversation. So hopefully that will, that will allow us all to learn from each other because it is a rapidly shifting landscape right now. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we will be sending out a follow-up email after this that will direct um, folks to the recording and also may have some questions if you want to sign up for newsletters or, or have some additional questions. I know all of us are getting inundated right now with emails and virtual this and, you know, all this other things. But um, if you are interested in tracking us, go ahead and shoot us an email um, or respond to the email at the end. And we'd love to uh, we'd love to connect with you and and pick your brain and keep this networking and dialogue going while we all find our way out of this box. Um, so thank you again for everybody being here. And because Westerville is focused on safety and being safe, I'm going to turn it over to Landrum to give a very brief safety presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Lucy. Um, so for safety today. Um, though it is March, I wanted to point out that uh, here in Colorado, we are still experiencing some nasty uh, weather events. Just yesterday, we had some rain, sleet, and snow, which presents opportunities for slips, trips, and falls. So I just wanted to share with you all that uh, be aware of your surroundings. Uh, make sure you're organized, whether you're in the office, your house, or the field working, and also make sure you're wearing proper footwear for what the, the weather calls for. Um, and that's our safety moment. And with that, I will hand on the reins to Chloe Lewis. who will talk a little bit about the Rocky Mountain region. Hi, I'm Chloe Lewis. I'm a business development and project planning here at the Rocky Mountain region. If you're not familiar with Westervelt, um, we specialize in mitigation and conservation banks. Um, those are rather traditional, but we develop large scale restoration projects that offset impacts to wetland streams and species in that watershed. The client exchanges credits um, for their impacts, which helps them with permit compliance. 
We also help clients with large scale permit irresponsible mitigation in which we do offer clients full severance of liability and Westervelt takes on the maintenance and monitoring of those wetlands in perpetuity. We also help clients with the development of habitat conservation plans and in lieu fee programs. We can help with program approvals, site specific approvals, anything of interest in that realm. And we also are active in sustainability and stewardship partnerships within our region. As Tyler mentioned, we are one of three large regions. There's the Western region, the Rocky Mountain region, and the Southeast region. We have a recently established satellite office in Tennessee as well, which is not shown here. This is just some quick statistics, statistics on our restoration numbers to date. We have restored three and a half miles of stream. Approximately 30,000 acres have been managed and protected and 8,100 acres have been burned. 47 species have been protected and we've planted over 1 million trees. Um, just to get a sense of our audience here, we were interested in what industry everyone is associated with who's in attendance today. We'll give it just a few seconds here so we can dive into Tyler's presentation, but I have a number of people saying other. <laughs> it looks like the water industry is taking the lead. So 34% for water, 24% for other, 22% for energy and mining with some housing, transportation, and development mixed in there as well. And then we are also interested in what your role is within your group. Are you an engineer, an environmental scientist? Do you do permitting all day, every day, and it's your absolute favorite? Zero for policy so far. Oh, here we go. Looks like environmental science is taking the lead, followed closely by compliance specialists. And quite a few people here are reporting that they are permitting specialists as well. So, have 22% for compliance, 19% for permitting, and 20% for environmental science seems to be the results. Well, thanks everybody. I'm actually gonna hand it over to Tyler now and we'll dive in. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Chloe. All right, um, first I'm gonna talk about Clean Water Act associated um, regulations. So primarily focusing on section 404 and 10, but a little section 402 thrown in at the end for you stormwater people. Um, okay, so what's going on with WOTUS? Well, first of all, what is WOTUS? It's Waters of the U.S. Um, these are the water features, primarily wetland and stream for which EPA and the Corps have federal oversight and jurisdiction. In the past, WOTUS was largely determined by court cases and um, Congress, but more recently, changes to WOTUS have been made by the president and executive orders and such. Um, what's happening right now with the new administration is that the Biden Department of Justice is freeing, freezing litigation associated with the Navigable Waters Protection Rule, um, which is which is also known as the Trump WOTUS rule, um, and is stopping defense of that in court. So we're expecting to see an update to the courts in May, um, but in the meantime, EPA is collecting data on jurisdictional determinations and. EPA headquarters is conducting a review to understand inconsistencies in these jurisdictional calls. Um, but WOTUS is potentially subject to the regulatory freeze and, and I'm about to talk about a little bit more of what this is. Um, let's see. All right, so the claim memo is the regulatory freeze. Um, it's one of Biden's 15 executive orders signed when he took office, allowing for freeze and review of items published or proposed on the federal register. 
Um, it allows agencies to postpone the effective dates and allows for a suite of other actions, including reopening for public comment, um, consider, um, consider pending petitions and further delaying their publishing, um, or implementing regulations. So um, when I refer to the claim memo, that's what I'm talking about is Biden's executive order um, that allows for regulatory freeze of items on the federal register. Okay, so as far as a Colorado WOTUS update, um, what does this mean in Colorado? Well, kind of hot off the press, there was a stay of the navigable waters protection rule in the state of Colorado until a few days ago when it was reversed by the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, this decision was issued shortly after the department had received notice that um, the DOJ motion to uphold or to hold the appeal in abeyance for 60 days had been denied. And so what this means is that the navigable water protection rule or Trump WOTUS is currently applicable in all states, including Colorado. Um, which leaves many ephemeral features unregulated. And, um, and that's a good segue to talk about the, um, what the CDPHE is doing in response to this action. Um, so this, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment has been holding stakeholder meetings for a proposed state dredge and fill permit that will create state protections for wetlands and streams that are not protected by federal regulatory authorities. So do not fall under the waters of the US. Um, definition. And so a white paper was distributed and feedback was solicited last year. Um, the last meeting, it was basically discussed that everything was going to go on hold until and the state would reconvene the dredge and fill um, stakeholder group and, and development of these different regulations if the stay was listed, which we now know that happened um, a few days ago. So basically the next step so that discussions will reconvene and that the permit program is going to continue to evolve and develop so that there will be a um, state protection of wetlands and waters um, that are not protected by the federal government under navigable waters protection rule. So if you're interested in learning more, there's actually a stakeholder web page. Um, you can sign up for updates and see how this uh, program evolves and, and emerges. Um, and like I said, this is going to be distributed later, this presentation, so, so you'll be able to access that link at that time. Um, so also now the nationwide permits are another item that um, has been, that have been, um, have some proposed regulations around them. Uh, a little bit about nationwide permits is that it's a core programmatic approval for minor activities, it's expedited review, so um, it authorizes some, um, some actions that have no more than minimal individual or cumulative adverse environmental effects. This is um, this quote is pulled from the Federal Register. To use a nationwide permit, you must meet general and regional conditions, and if the state has a 401 water quality certification program that they administer, or if it's blanketed into the nationwide permit, it also needs to satisfy um, those conditions. The nationwide permits can be reporting or non-reporting. So with reporting um, taking place as a pre-construction notification, typically non-reporting means that the proposed activities falls under the pre-construction notification um, published thresholds for that particular nationwide permit and the activities that it authorizes. Um, typically these are reviewed and revised every five years. Um, the nationwide permits have only been renewed three times outside of this five year cycle since they were initially published back in the 70s. And this is one of those atypical cycle years. So um, all nationwide permits were proposed for reissuance, but 12 existing are ending up being updated out of cycle and then four new nationwide permits are being, um, being pushed out as well. These 16 go into effect in a couple weeks on March 15th with a 2026 expiration date. And then the 40 existing unchanged nationwide permits are authorized until next year, but we will, we will talk about those a little more in this um, presentation later. But first we are going to talk about the 2021 nationwide permits. Um, so like I said, there's 16 that I just briefly discussed. Um, they were proposed in September of last year. 
They're published in January of this year and they'll go into effect in a couple of weeks. So this next slide is definitely text heavy. Um, it just lists the 12 that were reissued. So they, it kind of runs the gamut of industries and activities, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you guys read all these rather than me um, just list them out. So we're gonna focus, I'm gonna, I'm gonna briefly highlight these four. Um, hopefully they capture your industry, but if you'd like to learn more about different permits, we're happy to do a targeted presentation for your industry or even for a specific project. So please don't hesitate to reach out with that request. Um, you know, we, we want to be the folks that you um, that you go to with with permitting guidance and whatnot. So, um, yeah, take us up on that. And then these are the four um, new nationwide permits. And um, I don't really know anything about mariculture activities, but I do know that these two are a spinoff of the nationwide permit 12. And so we'll, we'll briefly talk about um, these two new nationwide permits. Okay, so if you're in oil and gas, this is probably a favorite. Um, Nationwide Permit 12 has been renamed. It was formerly Utility Line Activities, and it formally authorized utility lines, substations, oil and gas pipelines, foundations for overhead, utility line towers, anchors, access roads. Um, now, this former Nationwide Permit 12 is split between three Nationwide Permits, so one being this one, the oil and gas natural pipeline activities. Um, and then the utility line activities are actually authorized under those two new nationwide permits that I highlighted on the, the last slide. Um, the 12, the reissuance of the 12 is a result of um, two federal district court decisions associated with insufficient fish and wildlife consultation, that being one that occurred in Montana, um, and then another one that was a decision um, in the Coalition to Protect Puget Sound and, and the Army Corps of Engineers. So the most notable items with the 12, other than it becoming its, its own, um, own permit, is that there are previously seven PCN reporting triggers and this new 2021 nationwide permit removes triggers for mechanized land clearing, um, a couple of utility line associated reporting requirements mainly because this doesn't apply to utility lines anymore. And then a couple of triggers associated with permanent access roads were removed. They did add a um, PCN requirement for new oil and our natural gas pipelines that are more than 250 miles in length. So that is a new addition to this one. Um, the other three that I highlighted on that um, previous slide that were reissued, they, they fall into um, the same modification that was issued um, for 10 nationwide permits. So 21, 29, 39, 40, 42, 43, 44, 50, 51, and 52. And that's the removal of the 300 linear foot lot limit for loss of stream bed. Um, and that, that one half acre loss is still applicable. That's an individual permit trigger for most of these um, nationwide permits. It is important to note that a three one hundredth of an acre threshold was added um, for compensatory mitigation for stream bed losses. And um, according to the, the text in the Federal Register, this, this modification makes the compensatory mitigation requirement for stream bed loss equivalent to um, that for wetlands in the nationwide permit program. So that was the reasoning for that. As far as the two, um, two new spinoffs that were formally authorized in our nationwide permit 12, um, we have this electric utility line and telecommunications activities nationwide permit 57. Um, nationwide permit 57 and 58 were the result of that core proposal to carve uh, work not related to oil or natural gas pipelines out of that nationwide permit 12. Um, if you'll recall, last year 12 was frozen, was uh, not applicable for use for a lot of projects because of its ties to oil and gas pipelines and, and what was perceived to be insufficient consultation with Fish and Wildlife Service. So this just parses out utility 
um, authorizations from that. So as to keep them separate from any litigation. Um, Nationwide Permit 57 covers electrical utility line and te telecommunication activities. Um, so that's utility lines, telecommunication lines, substations, foundations, access roads related to electrical and telecommunication lines. And, and um, to use this nationwide permit, the, there may not, the, act, the authorization cannot authorize any activities that would result in a loss of more than a half acre of waters for each single and complete project. Again, that being an individual permit trigger. Um, and a pre-notification, pre-construction pre notification is required to use this nationwide permit if a Section 10 Rivers and Harbors Act permit is required or if discharge will result in more than um, one-tenth acre loss of waters of the U.S. And um, it's said that this permit is going to be a good complement to the existing nationwide permit 51, which covers land-based renewable energy generation facilities. And, and that was another one that was reissued and, and that 300 um, linear feet limit of loss threshold was changed. All right, so the, another new one that spun off of um, Nationwide Permit 12 is this, this for um, this Nationwide Permit 58 for utility line activities for water, other um, substances, so including utility lines and utility lines, substations, foundations, access roads related to utility lines. Um, and again, it's it's it can be used as long as the activity does not result in the loss of greater than one half acre of um, waters of the U.S. for each single and complete project. All right, so there was some speculation um, that the claim memo that Biden regulatory freeze would put this initiative on hold. Um, same with the, the four new nationwide permits um, that were issued. So kind of to be determined, but I will say that in, in speaking to the core this week and to our contacts at IRBA, um, the core is supposed to continue with the issuance of these 16 nationwide permits. That's what, what we, we believe is gonna happen or what folks in the regulated community believe is gonna happen. That's the word from Washington. Um, states are pretty frustrated with this nationwide permit process and, and the out of cycle because it has complicated the 401 process at the state level is what we're hearing. Um, but like I said, at this point, they're scheduled to go into effect in two weeks. Um, we do know that new leadership is coming in and that the Center for Biological Diversity has filed an intent to sue saying there was insufficient fish and wildlife consultation for these new nationwide permits these 16 reissued and new. So it, it may not resolve issues associated with the court cases that I mentioned briefly earlier. Um, and and this, this intent to sue is thought to, um, the we think that's gonna catch the administration's attention. All right, so um, last night, the regional conditions that are associated with these 16 reissued and new nationwide permits um, and the timeline associated timeline were published. Um, so these regional conditions, there are a couple less, but um, they do they do outline um, activities associated with construction of diversions and intakes, open trenching of perennial streams and impacts to peatlands, some stream stabilization items, um, gold metal, metal waters as defined by Colorado Parks and Wildlife and um, some items associated with section 401 water quality certification. So um, haven't had a lot of time to dig into those. Uh, we did comment on them as a region and as a company, but um, like I said, that, that email pretty much just came out last night. So that was, that speaks to the regulatory whiplash that probably everybody's having these days. Um, as far as stormwater, I just wanted to throw in a an, an small update on stormwater permitting with the state. Um, the general permit for stormwater discharges associated with construction activity has a modification. Um, so basically there was some really some updated permit language. Um, this went into effect about a month ago. 
And the state added diversion of surface water and emergency um, firefighting activities as allowable non-storm water discharge um, activities. And um, also did some revisions associated with um, owner um, on an application. So now that language is a little more general and um, refers to land and lease ownership as well as just um, as well as typical or conventional land ownership. And then the definition of final stabilization was was revised to include a list of stabilization methods and and those examples of those are um, permanent pavement or concrete hardscape, zero escape, stabilized driving surface, surfaces, vegetative cover or equivalent permanent alternative stabilization methods. So if you're interested in stormwater, definitely dig into that. Some pretty minor modifications, but um, could have some big implications on site stabilization techniques. All right, so now we can get into the bugs and bunnies. Um, there are some, that was a lot about water, but now we're gonna talk about um, species regulations and consultation. And this is, this is not a comprehensive list. This is pretty much what we're tracking within our region. So monarch butterfly listing, um, folks probably know that this, the, the listing decision was announced in December of last year as warranted but precluded. So basically, that means that the species warrants listing the population declines have demonstrated this, but there are insufficient staff or financial resources um, to list the species. That being said, there are a lot of many, many court groups that are felt that are um, challenged. Sorry, many, many environmental groups and industry group, industry groups that are challenging this in court um, and a final listing decision will be released in December of this year. So um, associated with the listing and to aid in species recovery and potentially stop the listing of the species, the Fish and Wildlife Service developed a candidate conservation agreement and assurances program. This is a voluntary program allowing participants or allowing applicants to enroll um, acreage, eligible acreage prior to the final listing decision being released. Um, this allows for a some regulatory certainty on enrolled acres when it comes to permitting of activities, as well as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service review of activities proposed on those um, enrolled parcels. So a little more regulatory certainty in um, future permitting efforts if you're able to demonstrate a commitment to conservation of the species. And the enrollment deadline is actually concurrent with the final listing decision. So it that is, um, 12 15 of this year um, and then also just let us know if you're interested in enrolling your company or client in this program because we've been following it really closely we've been participating in in the weekly calls with the program coordinator when they were having them and um, we are offering enrollment services such as identification of eligible lands and conservation measures um, application process and management and reporting activities so Again, if you're interested, just reach out to us. We have we have a much more in-depth Monarch presentation um, with a lot of really nice images like this. So uh, aesthetically appealing for sure. Um, as far as the other stuff that flies, um, we basically the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, it was passed into law more than 100 years ago. It prohibits the take a protected migratory bird species without prior and appropriate authorization. So killing, capturing, selling, trading, transport, um, any kind of harassment and, and stressors. So, um, you know, it doesn't have to only result in death. It can be um, species stressors. And it allows for the prosecution of unintentional acts. So think of BP oil spill or power line associated deaths, spraying of banned pesticides, et cetera, and, and how that affects bird species that migrate and those would fall under this act. Um, that being said, the Trump administration did publish, um, recently made some changes to the text to clarify that unintentional injury or death is not prohibited anymore. So, um, you know, that there, that's considered clear, a clarifying effort um, and, and 
the text and the regulatory text. But again, it does take out the um, ability to prosecute if, if unintentional death occurs um, associated with releases and, and other activities. And that was published before Biden took office, just right um, as Trump was exiting earlier this year. The effective date is about a week from now. But, um, you know, this, this is another one that We'll see what happens, um, kind of to be determined. We should know soon if the agencies decide to, decide to follow through with this change or open it back up for public notice and, and whatnot. Um, we only have about a few more slides, so hang in there. Um, CPW has, has a wildlife mitigation program that is associated with Senate Bill 19181 to protect public welfare. Um, oil and gas operations, and this went into effect um, January 15th of this year. So it applies to um, Form 2 or 2A oil and gas location assessment applications, and it specifically applies to oil and gas operators in that industry. Um, so it basically means that oil and gas operators will consult, will need to consult with CPW on effects to high priority habitats of certain species when submitting that um, oil and gas lease application form two or form two A. And like I said, this is this has gone into effect. CPW is um, reviewing applications currently, so um, kind of snuck up on a bunch of folks. But um, this is very text heavy. It gives a comprehensive rundown of the priority habitat subject to Rule twelve o two C. And I'm just gonna pause here. Um, oh, it looks like Chris had a, an update on the Migratory, Migratory Bird Treaty Act that the Biden admin dropped the appeal against the ruling against Trump administration. Um, so we're back to original rules, unintentional harm take is prohibited. So thank you. Thanks so much, Chris. I appreciate that update. And I'm going to assume everybody's done reading this this list and go on to the next list, um, which is also text heavy, but it gives a comprehensive rundown of high priority habitat subject to that 1202D um, rule. And it's, it's important to note that many species without previous state protections are listed here. So, you know, it, people are, are interested to see mule deer and, and some undulates on here that maybe previously didn't, weren't afforded these protections, but um, they are currently protected. And, and like I said, we're tracking this very closely. We have some sites that are of high value to some of these species. So um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us about this program or, or your potential wildlife mitigation needs for oil and gas projects. Uh, we're, we're always happy to talk about species. We have a, a bunch of wildlife nerds in this office. Um, the last thing is, uh, one air permit, state air permit update. I'm not an air permitter, so if you have any questions about this, please don't ask me. Um, but I did want to throw it in there since we're talking about regulations. There's um, some new requirements for oil and gas wells within a thousand feet of an occupied area. Um, this went into effect earlier this, this month, just a few days ago. This regulation establishes shorter repair response times for oil and gas wells located within a thousand feet of an occupied building. So basically if there's a leak, it must be repaired within five days after discovery. Um, and if it can't be repaired, then you have to let the, the regulators know why. And that can be anything, you know, from inclement weather to, to a, a whole group of other, or a whole list of other um, reasons for that delay. But, but it is important to note that an occupied building is considered a structure designed for use as a residency, indoor or outdoor school facilities, um, 5,000 square foot working areas with regular working hours or um, outdoor venue or recreation area. So um, kind of pretty broad definition there. Well, thanks everybody. Um... We really appreciate your time and we hope that this was informative. I know it's a lot of information. Thanks for joining and hopefully we'll have another, uh, another event soon that you guys can all uh, attend as well.